she was a Keralite and I'm a Keralite uh, well there has to be some reason anyway it was a good reason and uh, all of you young people here in uh, Parul University it is indeed my privilege to be here and to speak to you I am not sure what exactly I should talk about because as I was telling Deepika today I have not laid bare my life anywhere before I have talked about the individual subjects, whether it was water harvesting or sanitation or mines and minerals or sustainability issues. There was always a theme. But today, Dhruvil told me and Dr. Geetika told me, you talk about yourself. So there is, a, you know, there's a problem with all IAS officers and especially retired IAS officers. They're only talking about themselves. And all the time they have more and more to say about what I did and when I was that and when I was this. And that is very boring for all of you, I thought. So I thought I will share incidents from my life, uh, which will be more interesting because uh, as I was spending the time with Dhruvil and Deepika, I told so many stories uh, from my experiences that uh, they listened very, uh, very interestedly and uh, were eager to hear more. So instead of telling you, be good, be honest, be truthful, be a good citizen, you know, that everybody tells you that. So let me share some stories from my life which contributed to what I became. I don't want to go to the pre-IAS days, which also did a lot to my, uh, to my personality development, but starting with uh, when I was posted as assistant collector under training, I was only a trainee. Very soon you will be trainees in some place or the other. At that time, I went through some horrific experiences. The first of which was uh, a, few, a week after I was posted as assistant collector under training. My training was with the superintendent of police. I was, though I was not a police officer, I was expected to know how the police functions. So I reported to the SP of the district, which was Madurai district in Tamil Nadu. And he said, go to the inspector of police in so-and-so police station. He will give you training today. So I went there and the inspector was not there. So I was very put off. I said, look at these police fellows. They don't even keep time. They're not, this is the kind of training they are giving me. They asked me to come. They're not even here. Anyway, this is all, I'm telling you the story because there's a lot of destiny involved. So they told me he has gone to some other police station. You go there. So when I went there, again, the inspector was not there. Then they told me the police station is downstairs. Upstairs, there's a room. You go and wait there. Your young lady, you know, because of that time, they were not so used to women officers and all that. So they said, go upstairs and wait. So I went upstairs and I was waiting there. The inspector came and he apologized profusely saying, ma'am, I'm sorry, I'm late. I was held up. Of course, police fellows are always got so many other things which makes them very busy. So uh, there is ne never you can say that uh, he didn't have a good excuse. Anyway, while he was talking to me, I heard some blast. I had a second hand car I had just purchased. So I thought the four tires of that car had burst and there is this huge sound. So I thought, my God, I went and bought this second hand car. My car has gone. I didn't want to say, shall I go and look at my car and see if it's all right. I heard another blast. This time, I'm the daughter of an army officer. I knew it was a gunshot. So for the first time, I looked at the inspector and I said, I think it's a gunshot. He said, yes, I think so. So we just went outside the room and a constable from downstairs came running up and said, go back, go back. So we didn't know what was happening. So we stood in the little balcony over there. And as I was looking at the inspector, I saw a bullet go over his head and the debris from the roof falling on his cap. 
I said, my God, somebody is shooting you. And as I was saying that to look where the bullet was coming from, one bullet went past me and hit the wall, just past me. Then I saw there was a man in a police van loading the rifle. I was an NCC student, like many of you maybe. I knew loading a rifle, what it means. I saw him loading a rifle and pointing up at us. I said, somebody is trying to kill you. Because I knew it wouldn't be me. I was only a system collector under training. Nobody wants to kill me at that time. Now many people want to kill me. But at that time, I think nobody wanted to kill this young 24-year-old uh, girl. He, he was shocked. The inspector was completely under shock. I pulled him inside. And we both stood against the wall. And bullets fired on all sides. This is a real story. I didn't get the Bharatatna or anything, but it's a real story. And uh, for the first time in my life, there's an English saying, when you are very, very afraid, when you are very tense, when you are very frightened, your knees turn to water. You know, goodne pani jaisa ho jata hai. I felt that. I thought, maybe I cannot take another step because my knees are shaking. Because, you know, you, you feel the threat of life. And anyway, to cut a long story short, there were a few shots. We stayed inside, we stayed against the wall. The bullets went all around. After some time, the noise stopped. Some police constable tried to jump up from the wall from behind and said, lie down, lie down. We couldn't understand what was going on. Then the noise had completely stopped. We, I gently went forward to see what was going on. I found that a constable who had the rifle in his hand he was he had shot himself and there was blood on the road and he was lying with his firearm lying next to him he didn't know what else to do the person who was trying to shoot us had shot himself then all hell broke loose because uh, you know the worst thing that happens in an armed service is when one of your own people turn against you. They can face any number of people who is an enemy, who is a known enemy. But when one of your own people turns the gun against you, they don't quite know what to do. Anyway, what had happened was, by that time, the entire district administration came to know about it and everybody was rushing and the sirens and everything. And the SP came. He was most worried that there was this young assistant collector under training, an IAS officer who just joined service and her life was threatened in a police station. And it was the worst thing that could happen to a police uh, department. Anyway, what had happened was, uh, later I came to know, you know, let me finish the story here. Then this fellow was picked up. He had, he had shot himself through the stomach. The bullet went through his, uh, through his stomach broke some ribs and hit somebody on the road. He also did not die. That day nobody was destined to die. I hope you are all understanding my story. You are listening? Yeah. I know I can get your attention by telling you such a story. Anyway, this fellow was picked up, taken to the hospital. They did an emergency surgery on him. And since he had just broken a few ribs, and since many of you are medical students, even in that time in 1975, they saved him. He didn't die because the bullet had gone through. Somebody hit, but that person also didn't get grievous injuries. Nobody died as a result of this incident. But what happened was that uh, the evening's uh, Tamil papers, you know, the local papers that carry big and those days, no breaking news, no social media, no tele. TV anchor coming, bite, bite, madam, and all that. So the Tamil paper wrote in huge headlines, woman IAS officer trainee saves inspector. And my God, I was the heroine of the day. But what happened as a result was, my boss didn't like it at all. My boss thought, who is this chits of a girl? Just come here, she did nothing. And she's become a hero overnight. So there started my troubles. I started my life with this huge incident. 
of course uh, at that time you know it was just a local news it did not become a big national news or anything like that i became well known in the district no doubt i rang up my parents who were in trivandrum my father is an army officer he said well done brave girl you are the daughter of an army officer that's what you should be don't be afraid of the bullets anyway i didn't have a choice at that time the, uh, i didn't stop a bullet with my hand or anything it just so happened anyway two or three things happened one was just to finish the story that uh, the police uh, constable was uh, suspended he was uh, dismissed from service and the story was that the inspector of police had taken action against that police constable and uh, uh, it had taken him off work or something and this man constable got angry with the inspector so he decided to kill him and uh, he had gone to the earlier police station where he was supposed to uh, in where i had gone earlier for the first training there he didn't find him others he would have shot him there and killed him fortunately because of me this inspector had to leave this place and come here to the uh, second uh, station and then because of me again we went upstairs if he was downstairs this man would have come and shot him point blank what happened was he found that uh, we were not in the uh, in the police station he didn't know about me this uh, the the constable so he fired some shots to get us to come out so that he could uh, shoot the inspector when we moved inside and he couldn't get he tried to climb up the stairs and come up to shoot him he was wearing you know his uniform and carrying this heavy arm those days no ak47 and all old 303 rifle is a massive thing you know he carried that and as he was climbing the steps he slipped and fell down he probably had some ganja or something to keep him in a condition where he can go and shoot his own boss he fell down he fell down the steps he lost his cool he shot himself he said now the game is up so he shot himself up but he didn't die and then when the case came up he employed a very good lawyer in fact that law by that time i had already become and my training was over when the case came up uh, i will tell you more about it later i'm just telling you the story just to keep your interest alive for the present this lawyer was a lawyer who appeared in my court i was a magistrate under training so i was taking up cases also this was a very good lawyer in madurai who appeared in my court and uh, they changed the whole story that you know you some of you are studying law somebody studying law no no lawyer here okay you know what lawyers can do i'll tell you you know they changed the story that who is the fellow who got shot the fellow who got shot was the constable so this is a story these people have created amongst the police department the inspector shot the constable it is not the other way around because the inspector is not hurt nobody else is hurt the only person who has got a bullet through him is the constable so this is a big story that they are creating police department just to save their higher officials the inspector shot the constable the constable is injured he was to die he didn't die but the constable had they thought he was going to die so the magistrate came and took a dying declaration from him he told the whole story at the dying declaration they said they put the dying declaration under pressure that is not the true story this is the thing so then the only witness who was not a police person who did not have anything to do with any of these people was me i was the only independent witness who was not in the police department who did not know the inspector did not know the constable had no axe to grind with anybody so these people started bringing threats to me they started approaching me saying you please say you don't know don't don't say you don't have to tell any lies when we ask you questions you say i don't remember i don't know something like that then you know this fellow's life would be saved i said hey, it is my duty i saw something i cannot tell a lie i have to speak the truth anyway uh, it was much later that the case came up the lawyer was quite a brilliant lawyer 
even this constable even that the madurai the chota players i had uh, lawyers I, i i really admire lawyers who can think like that so i recounted the story in the court you know what happened and how this bullet came he asked me a very pertinent question he said you saw the bullet hit the wall on top of the policeman's uh, topi and you saw the debris fall i said yes he said do you know what speed the bullet travels at you could not have seen it you are lying you could not have seen a bullet traveling at that speed i got furious you know i just let out steam i said why should i lie just a manner of speaking i saw the bullet hitting i can't say i saw the bullet coming not explaining like that anyway they grilled me for an hour and a half they questioned me and cross questioned me and tried to say that i was lying and that i was a cooked up witness and everything then i started getting uh, very angry i was a young person with lot of hot blood in me and uh, so i said why should i lie and anyway the, the judge had to calm me down so this is the way you are yourself being a magistrate no no this is part of life you will take it this was a great experience for me and so i'm sharing it with you and um, finally the case went against him he was convicted but since there was no death neither suicide nor murder he was given 7 years in jail he was just given a 7 years ri in jail so that is how that case ended but as a result of all the attention that i got out of this case a lot of my peers and uh, others felt that i was getting more than my due they felt this girl has done nothing she just come and then uh, some bullets are firing all over the place she is in the news and she is a big shot she, everybody is talking about her anyway the result as i said was my boss couldn't stand me there were many reasons he couldn't stand me one was i was a woman i was a young woman i was a tall woman i was a talkative woman i was a nayar woman everything was wrong for him so he gave me the toughest assignments he gave me very difficult time and finally I, when my training was over i was posted as sub collector in a division in madurai district which was a very famous division where macaulay tn station all were sub collectors in the past it was a very uh, very uh, pr- uh, prized division in those days called ics division the dindical i was posted as sub collector dindical he was furious my boss but the posting comes from chennai not from from him he said i'm not going to let you join you you won't be able to hand just to some riff raff about some police firing and all you can't handle this division is a very tough division you can't handle it this is not the you go to some small place near chennai somewhere be comfortable this is too much for you i'm not letting you join i was broken hearted I thought I thought it was a great thing that I got what was called a manly division for me to handle as a young officer and this man was not letting me join I didn't have an option all my colleagues joined in their respective divisions I went to Trivandrum back to my home because I did not know what to do at that time a very senior officer the then chief secretary Mr Sabayanagar who I am very happy to say is still alive and last week celebrated his 100th birthday a great man he stood his ground and i really you need to applaud him at that time he told this boss of mine she will do as well as anybody else she will jolly well go there so this man had to eat humble pie he was forced to allow me to go and join there but he couldn't do a thing about it and then uh, i don't want to talk about myself you know I did many things which I became quite popular and you know um, there's always I want to talk to the young women here you know a uh, lot of times you think that being a woman is uh, is uh, is as a disadvantage but I turned every disadvantage into an advantage if I was being seen more if people were more interested in me I did things in such a way that they could talk about it because if it was a man they wouldn't talk about it because i was a woman they talked about it so little little things i became very popular those were the days when there was lot of uh, food uh, rice smuggling so one of our jobs was to stop the rice being smuggled from tamil nadu into kerala 
there was shortage of food you know those were days you don't know those days we, we really had food shortages i used to go and stand on the roadside in the highway not this beautiful vadodara highway you have these days horrible highway you know with nothing no light nothing something i used to stand where those days nowadays all of you are wearing pants suits and all from the age of 16 i'm wearing a sari so we only wore sarees and we could not disguise ourselves in any way so i used to stand on the road side at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the night and stop a lorry with a with a truck load of paddy or rice going the lorry fellow will think are ladki khadi hai kya baat hai and he'll stop then i'll swoop on him and catch him and then they got afraid of any woman they saw because they thought it might be the sub collector it might be somebody laying a trap for me so you know just one or two instances like this created an aura and an image that you know this woman is uh, and plus this police incident is invincible invincible and uh, rani jhansi jaisi hai all these kind of things you know i enjoyed it then uh, this collector this person who was my boss uh, uh he came to my district he was my boss you know so he came and he would never let me usually the boss and you travel together in the car he used to make me travel in the seventh car behind him you know big boss to bada entourage jata hai unke sath so we went to some tribal village and the people the tribal people were waiting with garlands for the collector and uh, the collector had alighted i was in the seventh car behind i ran up because you know he is the boss and i have to go and be there when he is present the villagers refused to garland him they said you are our collector and garlanded me i thought that was the end of my career because uh, this man he didn't know what to do he said no 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 i said no no he is the big collector i am a small collector he is the big collector please 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 put the garland back i can't take it out from my hand i can put it on his neck also so i didn't know what to do it was and uh, it went on and on like that one after another i'm just sh- sharing this early days with you and then there was an incident uh, i haven't written my book so this is the first time i'm sharing all this uh, there was an incident where a particular part of my division there was illicit felling of trees the whole hillside was being denuded of forest and people were coming and telling me you know people are smuggling these trees away from here so i went after it and went after the people who were felling the trees and it was a hillside with sari in those days no reebok shoes and beautiful shoes that all of you are wearing i wear chappal hawai chappal hawai chappal and sari mein ghum ghum ke unko idhar udhar pakda chamba and then uh, when i went to those hills uh, there were some matham some religious people standing there with uh, bhasma and vibhuti and kumkum and all saying this is our land nothing wrong is happening here i said nothing wrong is happening with you people but somebody is using your name and uh, cutting all the trees and i'm not going to allow this and then uh, a, a day later or so while i was sitting in my office in the sub collector's office sub collector is a very highly respected official even today i think in the in the division nobody dares to just walk in or anything like that this man the typical if i tell you you won't believe it but is the old hindi movie style person a real villain he was wearing a gold chain half open shirt gold bracelet and those days biggest sign of wealth and power was triple five cigarette you heard of that i don't know he came walked into my room threw the cigarette on my table and said if i can use punjabi which you may kudi tu kya janti hai something to that effect in uh, tamil and said what do you think you did a chits of a girl you can shake me i will cut all the trees that i want do what you think you can do and the poor pune you know you was a poor undernourished fellow little weak little tamil fellow he jumped up to kevan catch him i shouted at him i said don't do a thing i just kept my ground i just kept quiet i didn't stand i didn't shout back i didn't do anything i didn't know what to say he he thought that i didn't say anything he walked out and that was the end of it i didn't see a few days later the chief minister was visiting my division and he was passing through he was those days people used to go more by train not so much by road we didn't have these beautiful road the chief minister was coming and 
I as a sub collector should have been there to receive him. But my boss didn't like me, so I was nowhere there. I was standing behind the inspector of police, some last fellow there. The chief minister came. I had to wish him. He is the chief minister. He is the boss of the state. I am the local person. I was not introduced. Nothing. I was standing behind. And then he went inside the room to have a little wash. And after some time, my boss and the fellow who threw this triple five cigarette at me together went inside. I thought my fate was sealed. Finished. Khatam ho gaya. They are going to complain about me, and tomorrow morning I'll be out of this place, and that's the end of my career as sub collector in Delhi. But fate wills otherwise. Why I'm telling you this is even in the worst of times, if your fate is good, something will happen. You won't believe. As the train took off, it was about 11 o'clock. 12 o'clock, I got a message from the police saying, "Withdraw all security for the CM." He is no longer the CM. He has been dismissed. The government fell. I was saved. This is the drama of that happened. Otherwise, that would have been the end, and nobody would have known the real story or anything. Later on, I arrested that fellow. That was a big victory, and I had to arrest him, of course. And he will regret the day he threw the triple five cigarette at my face. But he never knew that the fate will go against him. But I am telling you all this because it's. it made me confident to face difficult situations knowing that if you keep on at it and keep bravely at it somehow the universe will conspire to help you somehow it will fall apart it may be not today it may be tomorrow and uh, the last thing i want to say about this uh, incident that collector was of course uh, transferred another collector came that new collector and i got along famously we were great friends he loved good food i fed him good food and we we, we got along very well anyway when this man finally had to write my report you know in the our system writing the confidential report is very important he didn't have anything to say against me because by that time i made sure that everybody knew what solid work i was doing and uh, he didn't he couldn't find a single thing to say against me so he introduced one little word he said this another colleague of mine who saw my report and usually they confidential we never come to know about it he told me this he said she is very populist not popular you know the difference between populist and popular there is a huge difference popular is a good word populist is not such a good word then his boss the then second secretary this all again how fate come he called this man and said do you mean this as an adverse remark because if this is an adverse remark it will have to be communicated to her and she will have to defend it he said no sir no something he offered because he never thought he would be questioned why he wrote that word he said on what basis are you saying this word popular do you know the meaning of the word popular he asked him because uh, if an adverse remark had gone into my report at that stage in my career it would have been very difficult for me to defend myself again and again and go on appeal and get it completely written off the record and he will say something i will say something it will just go on you know and it will be a huge thing hanging over my head but fortunately because this second secretary was a wonderful person called mr dribiam he was also a promoted officer but a wonderful person He and he was a great literary person. He was a great literary person in Tamil, but also in English. So he took that word "populist" and grilled this fellow and said, "Ye populist kya hota hai? Tumhare man mein kya hai? Ye ladki ne kya kiya? Populist karke tu kya badnam karna chahte?" Then he got scared. He said, "Chhoda sir, maine chhod diya, maine nikal diya." So that's how I got saved. Now why I am saying all this is in Malayalam. I don't know how many of you are Malayalis here. My grandmother used to say, "Are saying that if you teal kurtal veilatte vadilla, that means if you are a seed thrown into the fire and you sprout in the sunlight, you will not fade." You understand that? No clap. I hope you understand that. So what I am saying is, when you start life, when you start career. 
you must pray for adverse circumstances because that will contribute to your personality to your strength to your confidence to your capability if you have a smooth sailing and somewhere mid career you come across a problem you will succumb you won't know how to face it but when you are young when your blood is hot when you can face when you don't have other things like family and some other commitment and some other commitment when you don't think too much when you have all these problem you come out a very strong person a and b you build a reputation for yourself you build a reputation that sees you through your entire career the whole state the whole country the whole oh that lady oh that person oh that boy oh aisa hai waisa hai kuch reputation banta hai after that it's very difficult to live up to that reputation but banta hai kuch acha hai anyway this is one incident that i thought i'll share with you because that contributed to my being the person that i began to be and later on as was said in the opening i don't know if i'm taking too much time but it's an interesting story so i'll tell you um i i was posted as the first woman collector there were no women collectors at that time today it's a, it's no longer a novelty but uh, a lot of things uh, uh, mgr was the cm and uh, he had a big thing women's vote bank so he told a women's uh, gathering i am going to make thai margal thai margal in tamil means mothers collectors uh, so he got a huge ovation from all the women uh, voters and then i was one of the few young women available to be made collector so i went as collector at a very young age when my again my batchmates were saying isne kya kiya ye jaldi ja rahi hai again you know it was circumstances playing anyway i want to share one incident with you where sometimes showcasing your vulnerability contributes to your credibility i don't know if i'm saying something that you understand there were many things that happened but i will share again a law and order incident i had a hindu muslim riot in a place near tuchi and uh, in some stone throwing and of course like all these things happen they happen overnight nobody tells you some 24 hours later some information comes those days all this communication was not there sp was out of town there was nobody available some inspector was not there nobody was there some stone throwing was there some police lathi charge was there and one fellow died the moment a death takes place the whole situation changes the tensions became very high the people the person who died was hindu the other faction was muslim there was no other problem the village was going on for years together anyway it happened so the hindus said we will not lift the body till you take action against all these other people and the more the body remains there the more the tensions will rise at that time there was not all the media of today but even then i remember india today was the first one to arrive in trichy and the reporter from india today he was a sub editor somebody who i knew from college he said chila what a great thing this has happened in your district we we'll put you on the cover of india today and you will become you know well known person all over the country now tell us how you are going to have i said for heaven's sake please go away if you are my friend don't ignite it don't make it worse than it is then the dgp intelligence from chennai called me Shira, what's going on? I said, leave it to me, sir. Please, don't don't send police force from Chennai. Don't make it bigger than it is. One man has died. I'll handle it. Please trust me. Please tell the CM not to think about it, not to say anything about it. Leave it to me. I, in one day or two days, I will solve this problem. Don't make it bigger than what it is. Anyway, somehow the chief secretary was not so kind. He said, how many more people will you kill, Shira? I said, hopefully, sir, I didn't kill this fellow, and I won't kill any more. And I was totally you against the use of force. I was, I always have been, though I am an army daughter and all that. So finally, at that time, we had to take the police force into the mob and uh, remove the dead body because that was the important thing. I said, I will go with you. And it is just, you know, that. you need what i'm trying to convey in the story is 
besides everything else whatever may be your job you need to have not only mental courage but physical courage the physical courage to go out into something and at that time the police force they wore all barricade you know covered their nose mouth you couldn't see which one carrying big big uh, this um, uh, uh, this batons and uh, bamboo guards to prevent the stone from hitting them all of them were covered like that and they gave me all that also to put on to walk and take the body and go i said i'm not going to put any of these things i don't want to be seen as a person who's frightened of these people and uh, who i think of as an enemy if they want to kill me let them kill me it's all right but you know this uh, frail south indian lean girl of 28 29 years old walking along a posse of policemen all heavily armed it created a calming effect they thought our collector ma is coming to us without fear she means well by us nobody threw a stone nobody threw a stone we carried the body at the last minute i myself carried the body somehow we buried it once it was buried the problem was over but what i said is that fact that vulnerability of your being in any job whatever it is your vulnerability can showcase your strength also you understand what i'm saying sometimes it was a <clears throat> i think it was strategically something very well thought out in my mind that this will help this image of my going out there without any uh, you know it, it, i don't like to compare myself with great people but this is something that gandhi ji did that you know he was always in that non violent unarmed i will face it mob that gives the power of great credibility and great faith to people who you are working for they see you not as an enemy not as a as a authority of power but someone who is one of them and who wants to be with you that message was a very important message and i want to convey that to you all of you who think you are weak or you know people some people i have seen people who can't speak very well who stammer a bit or who are weak or who are disabled or some other problem with them somehow if these people come to the front and even stammer in the way they talk but they talk this strikes a chord with the people people feel that he is a good man he is a good person in spite of his vulnerability in spite of his weakness he comes before and talks to us so this is the second story i don't want to go on and on about these gory stories um, then i must uh, come to another incident which again i'm showing stories uh, of how it contributed i was municipal commissioner chennai corporation it was a uh, one of the most difficult jobs i ever did i used to say after that after this i can become the prime minister of india because it is such a tough job to be the municipal commissioner of a city of that size with the resources which was 15 crores in those days and with nothing and i said if i can handle this job i can become the prime minister of india or i will insist the fellow who marries me should be the prime minister So, so I, you know that that was the kind of thing that i used to think of of those uh, times anyway in that job what i thought was most important was the whole area of solid waste management of keeping the city clean keeping the city healthy keeping the city hygienic and it was a tremendous job we did not have corporates and others and solid waste management graduates in the works we had groups of people who were called adhi andhras they were actually dalits from andhra who did only sanitation work only cleaning work you know and those days there was lot of open defecation there was shit on the roads they used to collect it and only those people would do that work i had an employee strength in chennai corporation of 45000 employees 45 it was very labor intensive 46 trade unions 
and about 5000 sanitary workers my focus was on solid waste management i thought we have to get this right for the city and anyway so i used to go early morning to see the garbage collection work and we poorest with you know from the corporation commissioner commissioner deputy commissioner the engineer somebody 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 all there to supervise the little fellow who is gathering the garbage he is the one who is doing the work all of us are getting paid big big salaries and this poor fellow getting nothing as a salary is doing the work we all do this supervision tum karo ye kaam karo theek karo ye all this and maybe we went to one place and those days we had bullock carts to collect uh, waste I used to say the bullocks were my best employees. No strike, no demand, nothing. They would come to work every day. They were such good fellows. They were our best employees. Anyway, now we don't have bullock carts anymore. Anyway, the bullock cart was there. The person who was supposed to collect the garbage was nowhere to be seen. He had gone off, and somebody said, "I said, where is the man? He is supposed to collect the garbage." They said, "He is gone to take a drink. He is gone to the nearest daru shop early in the morning at 6:30 in the morning. He is gone to take a drink." So I said, "Catch him, bring him here." What is this meaning? Early morning, he is going off to have a drink. He is supposed to be on the duty. Anyway, they brought him. Totally shattered, the fellow was. He looked at me and he said, "He said, come here." He took me to the garbage near the garbage. There was the dead carcass of a dog. He said, "I have to pick this up. I can't be in my senses to do that." I have to drink something. Go out of my senses. Because as he was picking it up, the entrails were falling. The dead carcass of the dog. That changed my my whole life on that day. When I saw that, you know, it moved me more than tears, more than any movie, any anything could do. Because this was the life, and this is the the conditions of life we were giving to our people. And our people sit in all these and give complaint. Our garbage is not collected. This is not done. That is not done. Yeah, Karai. These people are the worst fellows. Anyway, I started treating them very differently because of this incident. I found that most of our sanitary workers died in service. They got TB. They got some other disease, and they died because their health conditions were very poor. And lot of the women had very. many gynecological problems including cervical cancer and lot of issues so i i started moving towards the welfare of the sanitary workers and i i can't tell you how much of of satisfaction it gave me to be able to do whatever i could do and i'm very happy to say i fought bitterly with the government and everybody shouted at me saying why are you talking on me they are always drunk they never do any work all kinds of things so i fought and fought and fought till i couldn't fight anymore and they were all temporary employees they used to be people who will come from andhra do the work and during harvest go away so they had no benefits no health benefits no insurance no pension nothing i got 30000 of them permanent status at government servants no clap i am sharing this with you because sometimes in your jobs you will look beyond yourself you will see the sufferings of others you will see the conditions of works of whatever job you may be doing you may be in an office you may be in a corporate sector just think of the person who is doing some so called menial work for you and think of his circumstances see what you can you don't have to be patronizing just treat them with dignity treat them with the respect that they deserve and make sure that they are properly compensated this is very important this is definitely something that i would uh, like to share with you now i'll just take two more uh, stories and i'll stop then you can ask me question then i will go to a nicer story i was then later on posted in the government of india and uh, i was promoted as joint secretary joint secretary is a big job in government of india and i was made horticulture commissioner of india and i loved the job it was simply fantastic because i was the first ias officer who was posted as horticulture commissioner usually they were always agriculture graduates so somehow and everybody told me shila it's a great opportunity this is the sunrise sector 
agriculture you know we now need to go into horticulture now this is about in 1989 90 long time ago at that time our budget for horticulture for the whole of india was 25 crores and the expenditure was only 17 crores they didn't know how to spend the money they just didn't know how to go about it and fortunately for me for all my early days of difficult bosses at that time i had the best of bosses the best possible boss as a secretary the best possible boss as a minister they both encouraged me and to cut a long story short i was able to raise the budget from 17 crores to 1000 crores and there was nothing that i did not do which i did not enjoy which i did not love i traveled the world from papua new guinea to israel all over the place and i can talk to you about it later about what we did but today if there is floriculture in india in the old days you know we have only had gardens flower gardens today everybody has a bouquet where do the flowers come from at that time you know floriculture picked up so many other spices picked up vegetables picked up lot of areas in horticulture today at that time gujarat has done wonderful work in horticulture orchards fruit today people are eating more fruits and vegetables fruits fruits nobody used to eat much fruits you know it was considered a rich man's thing or some uh, patient's food you know somebody is sick you carry some apple uh, but it was not a daily food today fruit is something that is in the market and everybody affords it and eats it this whole thing about a horticulture revolution taking place in the country i am very proud and happy to say that i contributed a tiny bit at that time the people who are working with me my joint commissioners and all that they used to find me hell because i was all you know they were in their 50s and 55 i was 35 and 40 years old i was full of josh se karna hai karna hai and my bosses were also very supportive pranam mukherjee was the vice chairman of the uh, was the chairman of the planning commission he supported a lot also he said yes this is the sector there's this young lady wanting to do a great job let's give her a full hand it was wonderful i never had such a wonderful it's a constellation of stars that come together and shine on you you know anyway finally i had to leave the job because a regular horticulture commissioner was appointed and i called all my staff and i said you know i love this job so much it was not a job it was a romance and my joint commissioner quickly said madam ne romance kiya aur hamare paas baby chhod diya that i never forget that because they said for you it was just this you know all this thing now we have to do all the dirty work and wash the diapers and clean the crying baby whatever but this was the joy of that and this joint commission still is in touch with me anyway that's a just just to show you how there can be uh, sometimes such a, such wonderful personal contributions that can contribute to some achievement in some state um i don't know which other story to share with you one little thing i'd like to say how i used a politician i'd like to share that story with you uh, i was uh, as was mentioned here i was uh, cmd of the water and sewerage board and uh, i need another session to talk to you about my interest in rain water harvesting and sanitation i'm not going to talk that now if you want i'll talk that because that will take me the whole day then we'll be really bored so i am not going to talk about rain waters and sanitation which is my life's passion now but at that time chennai district chennai city when i, I was earlier corporation commissioner then i was uh, cmd metro water had a huge problem of cholera there were cholera deaths people would die like flies one fellow dies tick 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 people would just die all over the place we had a communicable diseases hospital which was overtaken by mafia people would drink and drug abuse in that hospital because nobody would go there because of the communicable diseases hospital that whole place had to be revamped and everything and then i knew that it was fecal contamination of the water which was causing the cholera so when i became uh, cmd metro water 
I got an opportunity to that entire area was a very big northern Chennai, which is the old Chennai, as you know, in all cities, the old city is the the poorer city, the backward city. Uh, the, the place was unsure. And uh, I have gone and vaccinated people even while they are taking contaminated water. They say there is no other water, we have to take this water. I will vaccinate them, they will take that water, they will drink it. That was the condition. So, we were able to get some funds and uh, I sewered that entire area. Got the whole place uh, uh, laid with sewer networks. At the end of it, what happened was that everybody had to take a sewer connection for their houses or wherever they were staying. Now the connection rate was 10-20 thousand rupees or something like that. But of course all the builders as you all know, they will collect 1 lakh rupees from you but actually pay the water utility only 20. Anyway, 20 thousand rupees none of these people could afford. Because they were all very poor people. So I had a sewage system in place and no sewage flowing in. The sewage was again flowing on the road because nobody took connection. So I went to my board and I said, please let us reduce the price of this sewage connection so that they can afford the sewage and put the sewage into the sewage pipe. The board would not agree. I said, at least half, 75%. Kuch na karo, ye 20,000 rupees he kaan se dega. He, he, he won't be able to get that kind of money. And they said, no, this is a rule. We cannot, uh, there will be audit, yeah, wo, this thing, that thing. They didn't let me do it. So I thought, what should I do? You know? Then it struck me, let me think out of the box. There was a local MLA there. He was not my best friend or anything. But I thought I'll make him my friend. I said, uh, that man is a minister now. I should see, I laid uh, sewer lines in that area. And now nobody is taking connection. My board is not allowing me to reduce the price. I said, you go and make it a political issue. I am sharing this in confidence, this is not to be, I hope there is no press and all that. Anyway, uh, I said you make it a political issue and tell the CM that you know we have laid so line, the people can't afford it, I will give it at 100 rupees. Let CM make an announcement like that. You go and tell him as if from your constituency, you are going and saying this and giving the people so its connection. Madam Jalalita was the CM, she said 1 rupee, de do. And the whole place was sewered. You won't believe it. Chennai has had no cholera after that. No cholera? And actually it has become law now that uh, the economically weaker sections can be given at 100 rupees. That later came because this decision was taken. At that time, I broke my head to see something somehow was done. I don't know if it was ethical or unethical, but I thought the ends justify the means and I used, uh, normally we died in the wood, bureaucrats don't like to mess too much with the politicians, we like to keep our lines very clear. But uh, it was a win-win for him, for me, for the sewage system. Finally the sewer line was happy because the sewage came inside the sewer line, it was not lying on the ground. People were happy, everybody was happy, it was a win-win situation. So sometimes you know, something you have to think that you won't give up and that there is some way you can get the thing done and that the, uh, does get done. Uh, the last thing I want to say, I retired from service as Secretary Government of India in the Ministry of Mind. And my whole life I have spent on garbage, sewage, poorer people, vulnerable sections, all this kind of thing. This Mind's Mafia I hated. I was going there and sitting there and I said, I, I don't want to, let them do, let somebody else do this job. I can't at the end of my career, you know, promote this. I, I don't have anything against them personally, but this whole area, you know. But I didn't have a choice and I was not a politically strong person that I can choose my job. I had to be there and I had a tough, uh, I don't want to go into details, but there was a lot of pressure on me to do a lot of things. I didn't know what to do. So one of the things I used to do is, I used to take the car and go to the Prime Minister's office and sit in somebody's room. So they will look for me and say, Madam ka hai, Madam ka hai, Secretary Saab ka hai, Secretary Saab ka hai. And they won't know mobile because inside PM's office you can't take mobile enough. 
so the driver they will call say madam andar hai pm office mein hai pm i am sitting with some low fellow but i will sit there and this or i will go around ki madam kuch kar rahi hai kar rahi hai something i'm just sharing this as a strategy that i used anyway so i used that occasion to do something which is closer to my heart because mind was producing a lot of wealth that wealth was going to the state or to the central government and almost all the mines all over india are in the most impoverished places yes the naxal areas the forest areas the tribal areas the poorest place is the richest in mineral wealth yes or no yes you know some geography you know something anyway so i said let us do something to the mines act to see that some of the wealth goes back to the same area if it can go back there so i i said you know i had to clothe it with this whole thing of reforming the mine sector and all that and i told the mines industry also that this will be good for you if you share some of your income with the local communities with local populations they will be more cooperative with you you know a lot of them were paying the ultras and everything to be able to mine in those areas if you get the support of local people it will contribute anyway uh it was a little bit of a struggle but i was able to establish and today this is a reality the district mineral fund so every district with mines today the collector is in charge of a mineral fund which money can be spent only on that area and for specific areas of health education infrastructure water sanitation so so sometimes i have young officers in the district tell me they don't know that you know some of them do some of them don't they say you know this district mineral fund is a great boon we suddenly have a lot of money to do things in places where it is you know there's nobody to speak on behalf there's no mla nobody is talking about these uh, backward people all the money goes into already better off places that i don't want to get into all that anyway so uh, i am very happy that that it was possible. so even in places where you are not so happy with the job or where you think that there is not much promise if you have a passion if you have a commitment you can always follow it and take it to some the last point i want to make this is after retirement i was vice chairman of the state planning commission and by that time i had developed uh, you know this is a long story i don't want to i answer again in question i was in the ministry of agriculture as i said i was horticulture commissioner for some time i was also joint secretary of many other things in agriculture i learned of something which i called it's my own words the politics of grains there was something called the fine grains rice wheat all that all the fine grains and there's something called the coarse grains the millet the bajra the bajra the jowar the fox millet the banyard millet all these are called the coarse grains it used to bother me a lot how can something be a food can be classified as like fair and fairer sex and fair and something you know this fair love fair and lovely cream something which is uh, fair and white and something so it's a it's a fine grain and all these uh, dark something something are the coarse grains these so called coarse grains were the people's food were what our people ate and as dr geetika is here she is a doctor she would know they are far more nutritious than the polished white rice and the polished gluten rich wheat so so it's a long journey i have been promoting alternate grains and i'm very happy to say government of india recently changed the name of coarse grains to nutritious grains it was a long struggle and now they are promoting nutritious grains through noon meal program and it's a, it's a long story to take a long time maybe if dr geetika says today or in a big assembly i eat millets do you that every all of you will start eating millets but i don't want all of you to eat millets overnight but certainly one meal if you can support this sector 
it is a rain fed agriculture it does not depend on heavy irrigation it is the poor man's grain it is a livestock food it is a wonderful thing to uh, to re energize our agriculture to re immerse our small farmers and landless laborers and to bring nutrition back to our tables today rural india is the diabetic capital of the world yes or no everybody is having diabetes in fact when i go to the villager they very proudly say i have got sugar as if it is you know some rich man's disease and they very proud i have sugar do you have i say i don't have sugar oh you don't have sugar is it i have sugar they are very proud of it it's a sad state of affairs and i think we need to do a lot about it and uh, i'll stop at this point i did a lot of work uh, to promote millets a lot of people have been working on it no doubt but uh, i did contribute in a small way to getting 2023 announced by the united nations as the international decade of millets so boys and girls ladies and gentlemen i'll stop there it's been a fascinating long journey i have shared some of my adventures with you as i said my passions are many my interests are many and i'll be happy to share other experiences and other thoughts with you i hope i have kindled some interest not necessarily in the civil service but whatever the job whatever the opportunity do the best that you can don't give up and go on you will reach the top bless you god bless you thank you and we really felt good when we listened to the importance of law and its application in your journey so far so thank you ma'am and after listening to your astonishing and stimulating words i have so many questions that are popping up in my mind and i'll be shooting one by one uh, to you my first question to you is yes ma'am like we will shoot together there is nothing like that when you just began your career you were discussing about patriarchy so when you just began your career what were the societal hurdles which you faced and also what do you think has changed over a period of time i don't know uh, so whether uh, what hurdles i faced is something that is universal or not but what has changed is that uh, the novelty that we were 40 years ago is no longer there today you have any number of police officers you have pilots you have all kinds of uh, women in uh, the most uh, male type of jobs you have women joining the national defense academy as uh, army officers i always used to say i was born a girl so i became an ias officer if i was be, had been a boy i might have retired as a lieutenant general in the army definitely not as a secretary to government of india so you know uh, we couldn't even think of those jobs at that time today i think uh, it is no longer a novelty uh, to be a woman or to prove yourself as a woman uh, today you have to prove yourself as an individual you have to prove your own merit irrespective of your gender you have to be gender neutral in your thinking in your attitude and uh, uh, be the best that there is uh there will be no compromise on that there will be still some little patriarchal prejudices but you can easily surmount that because there are any number of role models i was recently talking about uh, the spice jet uh, plane that caught fire the wing caught fire recently landing somewhere in udaipur or somewhere the captain was a young woman pilot and there were videos of that uh, pilot uh, flying the plane with the one wing completely on fire the calm the absolute professionalism with which she landed the plane saved the plane saved the passenger now nobody will say a woman is not capable of being a pilot and a pilot in a disaster so you know these are untold stories unknown women but all of them have contributed to creating that space and i don't want to address myself to women alone i want to address myself to all these young men here also that if you are the best in category you have no place to go but to the top 
you have to make some sacrifices on the way you have to strategize yourself but uh, patriarchy or matriarchy are not so important today the issues are transgenders the issues are alternate sexual orientation what are your prejudices against all those how do you overcome those things and you have something like in the us where they have recently the supreme court has uh, has uh, abolished uh, has uh, made the abortion criminal uh, you know these are the kind of issues that are going to bother people like you much more whether you are male or female and whether even if you are a boy your attitude towards the other sex whichever the other sex is whether it is a female sex or a neutral sex or a sexually disoriented sex or a or differently oriented sex what are your attitudes to all this that will make a big difference to the kind of leader you will be to the kind of performer you will be the old issues of patriarchy and matriarchy are slightly they are there in the villages and all that they are very much there but in the world as you go along with a huge uh, life journey ahead of you those are going to dim and these are the issues that will come up more and more that's really inspirational ma'am each and every one present over here will surely take something from your motivation ma'am what do you think is missing piece in today's politics that can be filled by the youth i certainly won't say that all of you should become politicians um but i think we as voters have a big responsibility and uh, being actively engaged in the community around you is important and uh, being a force contributing to supporting good leadership will ultimately be to your benefit will ultimately contribute to a better polity of course there are lots of other issues there's money there's power play uh there is caste there are a lot of other issues but uh i think each of us has to think that uh, what am i doing as a citizen what is my responsibility to those around me to the community around me and uh, how can i see that the best possible person uh becomes my leader uh and how do i support him how can i support her how can i spread that word this is the best we can do and uh if that doesn't happen again don't give up don't say you know this uh, fellow uh, total rascal he has now got elected no i didn't vote for him i stood against him but then what to do now i don't want to have anything to do with these people as i much socho irrespective of all that irrespective of uh, what you find in the in the polity you have your conscience clear you have your eyes set on certain principles of what you are as a citizen what you should do irrespective of your profession for the community around you you can be a, it can be a small thing just look at your garbage see if you have segregated the garbage see you generate less garbage if possible i can talk to you about at length become zero waste homes it's a great contribution you can make to your country you know starting from small things like that there are many actions of ours which can contribute to a better country not necessarily only the political leadership we keep saying what can i do these are the people who are running the country what can i do that's not you can do a lot you must think that there is something you can do and somewhere somewhere along the line it will have its repercussions and it will if not anything else you will go to your grave a happier person a more satisfied person utna to bas hai utna to theek hai itna hum karenge to acha hoga truly pointed out ma'am the youth of the world's largest democracy that is india has the power to fill this gap does everyone agree over here 
that's good to listen ma'am moving in the same direction what advice would you like to give to the students who think that it is better to stay away from the web of politics i really don't know what to say uh see politics is also a calling and uh, uh somehow the word uh, uh you know uh, uh, we think of politics as the last refuge of the scoundrel as they say you know that's the famous english word i think churchill or somebody said that politics is the last refuge of the scoundrel uh, uh there's a story i don't know it's going around in whatsapp uh the person uh, there were three uh, people in the class one was the brightest person and uh, he became a top engineer which is sridhar the metro rail person the second was the second brightest uh, person he became a dull bureaucrat like me but he was not so dull he was tn session and the third person who was always failing became the minister of both of them that is how the system is that we may ultimately have to take orders from the person who was not academically the best in our in our, amongst our peer group but it is not some political person alone who con- who makes a country sridhar contributed to metro rails all over india that is his contribution irrespective of who his political boss was isn't it and so also so many others so it is not necessary that you have to be in politics to contribute to your country it can and if you can overcome the circumstances and contribute in any way maybe you should try but you don't have to also think at the level of uh, the prime minister of india union uh, uh, minister or something like that you can think perhaps in your village to be the panchayat president see what you can do for your village if you are from a village or if you are from the city along with your job whatever job you are doing be the municipal ward councillor see how you can contribute in a little you know your area better than anybody else what are the problems of drainage sewage garbage lighting roads the whole works civic problems people are suffering mosquitoes malaria covid all kinds of problems how do you deal with that maybe you can at a lower level learn the rungs of politics get experience get the uh, get the knowledge and know how of how to negotiate that space by starting at a lower level and seeing whether you have a flair for it if you have a flair for it maybe there's something called destiny also maybe you will go places maybe you won't but it's worth the trial and it is a murky area no doubt but in murky waters grows the lotus and maybe you will be that blossom you never know so do try it surely a wonderful piece of advice ma'am ma'am the ongoing 21st century is regarded as the tech savvy era and in the age of social media a lot of political views are exchanged online while this also creates awareness it also spreads a lot of false propaganda how do you think and use social media better uh, social media as you are all aware i am not from that generation of social media but i do think it's a double edged weapon one side information is at your fingertips the other side it can be totally distorted fabricated information which can completely skew up uh the reality and uh, force you into actions which are most undesirable so you have to treat social media with a lot of uh, care and caution verify today there are any number of ways by which you can verify the truth of many of the information that you are getting uh, uh we have many applications i think times of india have started something called fake news uh portal or something where you can go and check up any news whether it is fake or not uh this is the problem of an information revolution that you may have uh, a lot of information but you can have a lot of distorted information 
and because you are tech savvy and like our generation you have the tools of discovering for yourself what is the truth and what is not the truth and ultimately it's up to you what you want to accept you want to listen to the uh, untruths and half truths or do you want to listen to the truth and change your opinion so it is your moral fiber and your character which decide, which will decide how you deal with the barrage of information that is bombarding you from all over from all around from the world of it's a global village from all over the place you have to put filters access analyze appreciate and go forward it is your character ultimately which will decide what you will do with the information that is placed before you so don't get misled be led by proper information thank you so much ma'am all the youngsters present here are requested to incorporate the same in their respective lives moving forward my dear energetic audience the floor is open for you all now to raise your particular questions to ma'am and just raise them in a flawless and efficient manner because this is a golden opportunity where go, where you are going to interact with the guest one to one so let's begin the question and session from the audience as well mike good morning ma'am it was lovely to hear all these anecdotes from your life ma'am your career has been glorious you have so many accomplishments to your name but i wanted to ask out of this long list of achievements which achievement has been the most special to you which is the closest to your heart the closest to my heart actually you know to talk to you i have to talk about my accomplishments i didn't tell you about my failures because i don't want to depress you uh i've had my tough times too i've had very very tough times uh that in another session but it makes you a tougher person no doubt and uh no doubt many disappointments but uh, overall i've tried to be a positive person the the uh, the work that was closest to my heart is water conservation and uh, i was i struggled to get rainwater harvesting as part of policy when i was the cmd metro water and i could do only so much i got it i got it in and i was pushing it and pushing it but later we had the opportunity of getting the political executive to accept it and then it was put in the election manifesto and then it became state policy and then i had the opportunity to frame the law for compulsory rainwater harvesting and it was not just that it was the whole process of pioneering that work in india for the first time as a, in a legal framework to implement it and to see the results thereof that uh, has been something that uh, has been closest to my heart and uh, you please have another session on water i think that overall the water crisis is blown out of proportion there is the same amount of water on the planet that has always been there no water has fallen off the planet right the water is still there the question is how you use it and how you conserve it that you'll have to pay me to consultancy services to tell you more about it anyway i'm just joking um i'd love to share it with you separately but what a harvesting especially urban rooftop water harvesting was a huge challenge and in a water starved city like chennai i had to deal with several droughts i had to deal with several floods so it was not the paucity of water but the mismanagement for water which is causing the crisis either in droughts or in floods to harness that water was a challenge to harvest it in urban areas was a huge challenge and uh, uh the whole work of pushing it through 
as a, not only as a government program but as a people's program was something that uh, i think was uh, my personal high that was the best achievement that is one the second i didn't achieve much but an area which i i would love to talk about is sanitation today of course swachh bharat those days we used to call it nirmal bharat abhiyan uh, this has been going on i always say that you know each uh, of course today swachh bharat program is really fantastic that the prime minister has himself taken it up i would have given anything to have the prime minister of my time doing the uh, a program for sanitation anyway i used to say in those days that you know the toilets that were built in the past you dig up indus valley civilization you will find some old toilet you buy each time this man that man so many toilets have been built in so many years every civilization some remains you will find of some toilets built in the past so it's not building toilets which is important but sanitation as a technology which is important and i personally again i will need a lot of time to talk about it i believe in water less sanitation dry composting toilets take the water out of sanitation you have a sustainable sanitation system this was something we did always we went to a european model based water based sanitation which is the source of all our issues today i haven't been able to do much about it but let me say that an ngo who i promoted a lot and i share the story with you it's a lovely story uh, uh an ngo near trichy who i promoted a lot for dry composting toilet which we call eco sanitation we promoted it in a place where there was not paucity of water there was too much of water it was on the banks of the river kaveri where water table was very high so the soap pit toilets were all getting flooded and all the wells were getting contaminated with the uh, soap pit water going into the well so people responded to a dry toilet better than in an area where there was no water because people would think this is a second hand thing you are saying because you I, you give me water i'll manage everything the whole story of toilet there is no water so you know toilet is sinking this is all rubbish anyway i'll come to that later anyway there we were able to get and my mascot was a woman called mangala tamal who was a village woman who understood it you know with her native wit this makes sense and she built the first eco san toilet we made that whole town eco san toilet because everybody was willing and we made a public toilet which was an eco san toilet where what is it's called the urine diverting toilet udt the urine goes separately the fecal matter gets uh, goes separately urine is collected used as fertilizer fecal matter is dried and used as fertilizer anyway i'll talk to you about this separately i don't have time now but in that public toilet we said instead of pay and use use and get paid because you are giving us valuable fertilizer you are giving us valuable nutrient so this was a great thing you know it was a of course it didn't make very big news and all that because all these things don't make news somebody is hacking somebody somebody is raping somebody all that makes news the urine diverting toilet is no news to anybody anyway uh, so this was very popular and we gave only 10 paisa or 1 rupee or something but later on i was secretary in government of india for water and sanitation and i tried to promote this idea of uh, eco sanitation and i had this wonderful person as my minister he is no more now god bless his uh, soul raghuvansh prasad ji he was a wonderful person he was from bihar and uh, he spoke his bhojpuri bihari hindi which i didn't understand a bit but i somehow communicated with him and told him the possibility of eco san toilets and uh, because he is a rural person and not uh, so uh, you know uh, influenced by all these uh, modern uh, ways of living and you know uh, whatever anyway he found a spark in what i was saying so he he told me this story himself he went somewhere in bihar 
एंड स्पोक टू हिस्स जनता हिस्स वोटर्स सर हमारे पास दिल्ली में एक मैडम है वो कहती हैं कि ऐसा करो कि तुम शौचालय आ जाओ और तुमको पैसा देगा सो एवरीबडी सर ऐसा भी हो सकता है साहब नहीं सर हाँ वो मैडम ने किया है कहीं पे तमिलनाडु में किया है तुम भी हम भी कर सकते हैं बोलते हैं सो आई बिलीव वन फेलो गॉट अप एंड सेड साहब वो कितने बार जा सकते हैं सो ही सेड ही डिट हैव द आंसर एंड ही केम एंड सेड अरे भाई सेक्रेटरी साहब ये मेरे को ऐसा क्वेश्चन पूछा आई नो डिट नो वॉट आंसर टू गिव आप क्या बोले आई ऑल्सो डिट है आंसर so i rang up the person who was doing that in trichy and i asked him i say subramanian this is the thing you know ministers ask this nobody asks us this question but somewhere a wise bihari rural farmer has asked this most pertinent question iska to jawab dena hai he gave me the answer he said four times madam fifth time send him to the doctor something is wrong with him <laughs> anyway i am happy to say that this person 2 years ago got the padma shri for his work on eco sanitation so maybe i can see i must tell you again you know in space there's a beautiful nasa clip of toilets in space i don't know if i am taking to my Does it interest you? Should I tell you the story? Okay. In space, it is eco sanitation. So I love to tell this story to all these high tech people who think only high tech man. Highest tech is in space. Frontier technology is in space, right? There, urine is separated and is recycled as water. And fecal matter. You should see that clip. There's a video clip. Toilets in space. Please see that. and the fecal matter is actually 80% moisture it is dried it becomes 20% dry matter if you put water into it it becomes 100% 200% slurry and sewage and all the problems of that so in space you cannot carry 10 liters of water for every flush you have to have something which is not water based so they have a drying system where the fecal matter is freeze dried and then you must hear this man saying it you know he explains it how in space it should not be floating around because if you ingest it you will fall very sick and so it has to be all collected it has to be collected separately and then it is freeze dried and when there is sufficient quantity of that freeze dried fecal matter which is the shed they put it into a space capsule and put it into the orbit and it burns in the atmosphere and then he says the next time you see a shooting star that's what it might be Jai Hind ma'am I'm honored to meet a person like you My question is what inspired you to choose the UPSC path as a career option and what was something that didn't let you go off the track As I said uh, uh my background has a bit to do with it uh I am from an army family so as they say we are the army brats you know we are brought up as soldiers uh, so i didn't have any particular gender orientation that you're a girl you can't do this or that or whatever and uh, as we were growing up uh, we were always told that you know you have to you know earn your own living there's no question of not doing that you're a, you're a human being born on this earth there's no question of you being a dependent on somebody you earn your own living so we looked at career options and basically it was not a great thing for me because i am from a family of clerks as they were i am not from a family of businessmen from my father's side they were all army people from my mother's side they were all people in government service here and there so it was not a very big uh, thing and uh, uh as a student i was a student leader myself and uh, even today i say i was president those days 
the president of the college union was a big thing not the secretary i still even today say that the power i had over my 2000 students who i was the elected leader of i never felt as an ias officer you know uh, that that was something unbelievable to feel the the love and affection and the support of so many of those people who you represented as a student leader as a student leader uh, i i went to a government college uh, and i had not seen poverty or uh, or want at close quarters because i came from a middle class army background that i went to a government college where i saw for the first time my fellow students who were from very poor backgrounds and as the president of college union once for some occasion we closed the college for a holiday and all the girls were celebrating that the college you know we got a holiday today we got a holiday today and some girls were crying as the president of their union i went and asked them why are you crying we everybody is celebrating it's a holiday they said if we go home there's no food the mess is giving us our food i will never forget it 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 made a great impact on my choice of what i would do and where i would go and uh, at that time we requested the principal and kept the mess going and allowed these girls to stay in the hostel in spite of the holiday because today things are very much more different but that was the condition of of a lot of people and i think all those inputs contributed to my choosing a public service uh, and uh, at one time i had a fascination for law i i really wanted to be a a good lawyer i was a debater in college uh, so i loved uh, speaking the pros and cons and i used to admire all the lawyers uh even now i watch uh, i was telling deepthi i watch uh, series on uh, lawyers and how they uh, proceed and deal with cases that fascinates me no end you know the marshaling of facts uh, uh, the demolition of certain facts on the other side uh, the rebuttal the, the sharpness of wit and the The, the need for collection information that fascinated me a lot but in those days uh, uh, law was uh, not a possible career for an upcoming person and lot of people said you will die of starvation they, you are not going to get anything out of this you can uh, anyway it, I, i didn't go much in that direction i came into the public service commission and here is where i am 